Okay, Yamilet, thank you for agreeing to participate in the Global Feminisms Project. So we'll talk for about an hour, and I'll start by asking you first about yourself. Your, your personal history and things like your family, your childhood. And then I'll start asking you about how you got involved in the kind of work that you do. And then we'll end with the work that you're doing now. So I know you're probably used to talking about your role organizing with women. Yes, but can you start with your personal history and tell me something about your earlier years um, and tell me where you were born, where you grew up, what was your childhood like? Well, I um, want to thank you very much for choosing um, me um, from the many women who are the feminists of Nicaragua. In my country, there are many valuable women with very interesting stories, worth retelling, uh, strong women who were pioneers in feminism. And well, I have, I've been involved in feminism for a short period of time, I don't know, maybe 20 years, um, more or less. Uh, there are many women who have made history and have made theories within feminism. Well, I was born in a town um, which is called El Viejo in the department of Chinandega. Um, it's a, you know, it's a peculiar name. It just doesn't really fit within the norm for, you know, a settlement to be called, you know, El Viejo. Um, it received this name, they say, because um, the cacique Agateite, um, because prior to the colonial times, or a actually during the colonial era, if I'm not mistaken, and um, supposedly he, he was a cacique that ruled these lands. Um, and, you know, as time went by, he, he became old, and so this old man was in charge of caring for this land. Another story claims that it's because one someone, an old man, brought a statue of the Virgin to my town, and the Virgin um, stayed in my town, and people um, referred to um, going to the Virgin of El Viejo. And it just stuck. And um, there are many stories of how my town's name came to be, but I don't think that's what's most important. I was born in a small, semi-rural, semi-urban town, a mixture of these two things, into a very humble, poor family uh, that lived in, um, in a neighborhood which was on the outskirts of town. And my mother worked um, in the banana plantations um, in the west side of the country that were, um, let's see, in the 60s and 70s, um, they were developed. Uh, those were the years in which um, the banana and uh, cotton industries were developed in the west side of the country. They cut down all the trees in Chinandega and began to plant bananas and cotton for export. So um, my mother worked in the plantations and um, She's also a seamstress. She finished second grade. And I'm the daughter of a man who, well, he didn't finish even the first grade, but nevertheless learned how to read and write. And during some time in his life, he was a political reader during the revolution and always um, ready to give his support for the revolution's cause. And so, well, from a mixture of um, these two honest, hardworking persons, and that I come from, from that. We are two sisters um, from my mother and father, and my father had another three children um, outside the marriage. Today I was, um, you know, talking to a friend of mine, and I commented that my father was a, was a Don Juan, you know, a, 
a man who, if he saw a pretty girl, he would, you know, try to seduce her. And, and well, sometimes the pretty girls would be interested in him too because he was a handsome man, a very handsome man in his youth. Anyhow, um, this is the type of um, psychological violence and even discrimination um, that my mother lived because he always had many girlfriends, many other women, and my mother was there and she was his wife. Um, well, currently they, they are together, uh, juntos pero no revueltos. <laughs> My mother will kill me the day I tell her I said this on camera. <laughs> but she, she decided about uh, 25 years ago, more or less, to separate from him because she, she no longer loved him in the way she used to. She wanted to end a relationship that no longer satisfied her and she decided to to stay, to be alone. He, well, he decided to stay there as, as company, which is what happens with many couples, right? Um, and well, they continue uh, to live in the same house. She lives her life and he lives his. They talk to each other. Sometimes they fight with each other <laughs> because really they are like um, two old partners um, and have that type of relationship. Sometimes friendship, sometimes divisions, you know. You know, this is my part and that is yours, you know. Within our family, she broke with those norms um, by separating even though she didn't do it legally. In the family, it's not permitted to leave uh, your husband, no, no matter what. Um, even if he's psychologically violent or even if he be beats his wife. We were a traditional family within what was normal for families in Nicaragua. So I was able to see um, what a relationship like theirs was like and that it was not the most adequate because they were always fighting, always in an argument. And I grew up listening and watching how they fought. And she would tell me, even though she was still with him, and she was probably still in love with him, but she would tell me, you have to study so that no man can boss you around. You have to study. You have to be independent. You have to earn your own money. You know? Those were like, you know, the first signs of um, autonomy and I would have to say of feminine, feminism also at, at some level. Um, and I began to understand that not everything was like that, like she had lived. Another thing, um, which my grandmother uh, used to say, she was still alive back then, and she would say, love does not take away knowledge, which meant that no matter how much in love you are with a man, it does not mean that you have to put up with everything all your life. You know, that's th the knowledge that you have, you have to protect yourself and you have to love yourself. Those were um, like the two lessons that I took from, from these two women who are for me the, the fundamental pillars of my own internal power. Within my own life, um, there were many, uh, many violent men Many, many violent men. Uh, my uncles, my uh, cousins. Um, we knew that sexual abuses were were being committed. You know, like I said, we, we were an average family, like any other in this country, where many sexual abuses take place, um, as well as violence against women, battering, and where the norm you must follow uh, regardless of what my mother and grandmother had told me, the norm was, you have to suck it up because he is your husband. 
you know, and also that you don't talk about things in family outside the family. Um, you don't, what happens in the family, you don't air your dirty laundry in public. And I kept thinking, and I would say, well, okay, it's true that things happen inside the family, but we can't just keep on being quiet about it. We can't be silenced. And one day, I decided to talk about um, the abuse I lived and the abuses that my nieces lived. How old were you when you decided that? I was 17 years old. I was 17. And that has to do with the fact that um, uh, when I was 15 years old, I decided to start a relationship, like a, to have a boyfriend um, with, his, with the man with whom I am still today. So this person, just as young as I, you know, very young, both of us very young, well, we would talk a lot. Now he talks less. It's terrible. <laughs> he used to talk so much more. Um, <laughs> and um, we would talk a lot about life, about the situation, about what ha went on in our homes, in his home, my home. Anyhow, all the things that supposedly you don't talk about with your boyfriend because the norm is that you're always kissing and hugging and touching. You know, those are the normal things that happen between, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend, right? But we talked about much more than that. Um, and we decided later to get married at seven, when I was 17. Um, it was my personal decision at that age. Um, you know, besides, the revolution had already triumphed and I had already participated um, in the National Crusade for Literacy since I had been 12, and I had already participated um, in the... How old were you when you participated in the Literacy Crusade? I was 12 years old. <laughs> I, I was still a child, but I felt older. I felt mature. So I decided to become involved and and my mother would say and with whose permission are you going and I would say but it's fun we're gonna go teach somehow I would find a way to convince her uh, to let me go to the training workshops uh, so I could learn how to teach people to read and write how does a girl so young learn about uh, getting involved in that if their parents aren't facilitating that Well, because, well, you see, they, they did have, um, they were very socially conscious. So although they complained about it, my own father was very involved in the revolutionary process. He was involved with the unions, you know? So I would tell myself, my father is involved. I, I also want to be involved. Um, and they would have uh, cultural events. And one way that I had to participate was by singing, uh, singing revolutionary songs with my father who played the guitar, and he, he still plays the guitar. So I would go with him to sing during cultural events in my town and outside my town. I'd go with him, you know, the little girl would follow him to sing. And on the other hand, my mother who, you know, in the process of being um, a seamstress and, uh, you know, a plantation worker, well, she would tell me about the injustices and discrimination within her group. Um, they were treated like prostitutes. People would say that um, the women who worked at their plantations were prostitutes, and she would, she would complain about it. But she would also refuse to feel like a prostitute because, you know, she wor they weren't. She would say, we are field workers. Why do they have to call us that? So, um, in a way, they, they did agree with my involvement. It's just that they were very, very scared because the war was going on. You know, the, the war was going on. And even if the revolution had just triumphed, um, there were still people who would show up dead around town. Or we would hear about people who would show up dead throughout the country. So there was a lot of tension. Um, lots, mothers and fathers were, were scared. 
um, so she would say, uh, okay, okay, you can participate in the cultural events, but other activities, no, something could happen to you. So I would go to the cultural events, and sometimes 200 kilometers uh, from my town, um, so we would leave one day and come back the next, you know, and um, during that time I was in a group called Association of Amateur Artists. <laughs> <laughs> and it was uh, awesome to be part of that group because we would do theater, we sang, we danced, and we expressed ourselves as youth. Um, later, um, when I was 13, I was also the president of the Federation of Secondary School Students. Between 13 and 15, I was the president of the FSS. I was uh, such a young girl hanging out with a bunch of kids from first to fifth year. Uh, during that time, they also sent us to cut cotton to defend um, the revolution's crop. Um, so I also joined a um, production battalion along with uh, over 200 students. And we went to Punta Ñata and Cosiguina to cut cotton. And then uh, those areas were still war zones. Then I went to become a teacher and, um, and then returned seven months later. I, I went to Cuba to study uh, to become a teacher with a brigade called um, the 50th anniversary, um, the 50th anniversary of Sandino's birth. So this brigade was organized to, to commemorate that date. And I was part of that brigade, and I was placed in Guantanamo. That's where I learned to be a primary school teacher. And then I was sent back. Um, the members of this group, we decided oh, we were you know, 16 by them. We'd been together from 12 to 16. And at the age of 16, I decided to go to Somoto, also a war zone, Esteli, Somoto, Ocotal. All of the Segovias were war zones. Um, that's where the um, that's where the Contras were. Yeah. How old were you when you went to Cuba? Sixteen. Yes, sixteen. And at that age, well, I I went to teach in the countryside. I was in charge of um, a classroom with two grades. I had second grade and fourth grade. I had already been trained in teaching multiple grades. Um, so then I, I taught second and fourth grades in Somoto in an area called El Rodeo. El Rodeo number two. Uh, so it was relatively close, but it was also dangerous because it was on the other side of the Coco River. And on the other side of the Coco River was the Lancite Hill, which was occupied by the Contras. Um, so every night, if, if we opened our windows, we couldn't see the stars. Uh, what we saw were the tracers, the, um, the red bullets, the tracers from one side to the other. Um, my teaching partner, um, you know, we, we roomed together in a family that was assigned to us um, with the Alfaro family, very, very lovely people. Um, we would say, Fran, Fran, I would, I would say to her, her name was Francisca. I would say, Fran, look, there goes another tracer. And she would say, yes, let's go to bed so we don't see them. But I would say, but you can hear the gunshots, you can hear them. You know, at that moment, I wasn't even, I, I didn't even have an idea of fear. What I wanted was to develop myself as a teacher. I, what I wanted was to help the revolution. I wanted to, to teach them um, like Carlos Fonseca had told us to do, also teach them to write. I was a faithful believer of um, that revolution, of that life project for an entire nation. And I am still a faithful believer that it is in education, that education it is the principal base on which a nation can develop. As long as you have people um, in the dark, not, um, not knowing anything, of course you will be able to do what you wish with them and manipulate them. Ignorance is the best friend of manipulation. 
and um, the manipulation of abusive people. Mm -hmm. So, so there, I um, I grew up that way from from the time I was 12 to when I was 16 in a revolution that moved my senses, my feelings, my emotions, and mixed in with all that, my relationship with my boyfriend. Um, so, for me, this was um, a life lesson, and and also a lesson for. Um, for that future couple, that future family. Because in those times, there was a lot of talk about, ev about equality, and I believed it. I believed it. I, I can tell you all this now like, like an anecdote, but it's true, it's, it's real. When my boyfriend would come to visit me, um, instead of um, talking of of kisses and hugs and all that, what I would do is I would take out a magazine that was called, back then it was called Los Muchachos, which talked a lot about sexuality and provided a lot of orientation, I think, in, in a very advanced way. In those days it had plenty of information on equality between men and women, about equality during courtship. And uh, now I know that uh, Sofia Montenegro was behind, behind that magazine because it was part of the ideological framework um, of, the, uh, of, the, um, of the graphic instrument that, um, that was there to be able to give information to the youth. Well, and I was part of the youth that read that information. She was already tech talking about sexuality. Auxiliadora Marenko, another female psychologist, was already talking about those things. So then I, I believed it because I, I liked it too. I, I also identified very much with it. So I would read this with him and then he used to say, when, when we get married, we're going to have six kids. And I would think to myself, hmm, this guy's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who's going to bear him six child, ch six children, but not me. Me? Never. Um, one, maybe. Two tops. And really, I, I have two children, a daughter and a son. But it was a good uh, coming of age for me. A good coming of age within everything that the revolution represented. With all the sacrifices that many of us youth made, um, both um, men and women, the people who um, joined the military service, the people who went and did other things. For example, us, the, the Brigade 50th Anniversary Group, we left our homes and lived in the countryside for two years out there in the bush and, and, and teaching. And after that, I moved to the West and continued teaching and being part of the brigade. Later, um, all then um, the Ministry of Education incorporated the bunch of us who had studied to become teachers. You know, and um, when I was in Somoto, uh, the person who um, and I had no idea that I would uh, ever meet her again later in my life. Um, but the person who um, how do you, uh, monitored our um, revolutionary activities and our educational activities was Marta, her, Marta Munguia. She was part of the Ministry of Education and the Association of Nicaraguan Women, AMLAE, which was um, a joint project, and they worked together. And well, I, I asked her one day, Marta, when, when I saw a picture of her when she was young, I said, Marta, this woman, she's the one who would um, visit us in Somoto for the meetings with the Ministry of Education. And she tells me, that woman's me. I would go to those meetings with the Ministry of Education representing Amlai. So I told her, I was in one of those meetings. So, you know, see how, how chance later brings you into contact with those same people, you see? So in my life, a Sofia Montenegro, uh, through paper, through concrete information, and also a Marta Munguia, through her follow-up and um, monitoring work that she did back then. I don't remember what they called it, but you see, then you see yourself as part of that network. 
of that revolution, well, um, it's nice. If you um, stick to the objective of honesty, the objective of equality for all, for men and women, not just equality for men, and you know, for those four men who are today the owners of this made-up revolution, but of a whole revolution for a whole country. To be part of that, you you used to feel like you know a little you know piece of sand, and suddenly you see yourself um, with all these monumental women, uh, you know because of their thoughts, because of their actions, because of their honesty, because they are part of what um, is now. Uh, that great women's movement, how all that was built slowly, I, I think it's beautiful. In addition to the seed, that, that concern that my mother and grandmother had already planted in me, and of my need to do something social, which um, I saw in my father with the work he had um, with all the organized um, men and women in Monterrosa, which is a... Um, um, it's a sugar processing plant. Um, you know, it's it's um, it's a place where they process, they produce sugar. Uh, well, I I slowly formed myself in that way, and that concern of searching for something that represented women, searching for something that uh, resignified, resignified what it is to be a woman. When I uh, turned 17, I said, all right, we'll get married, you know, bowing to my mother's pressure. But, but still, I said to myself, I am getting married, but I'm doing it because I want to be free. This is, this is contrary to the norm. <laughs> my mom calls that um, dog's enrollment, which is to say that you enroll um, yourself into marriage. She says, you're the one who enrolls yourself and then the man owns you. But I said, no. For me, getting married was my ticket to freedom. So I would uh, not have to live under my father's orders or my mother's. And I had it easy with my boyfriend. <laughs> very easy. <laughs> very, very easy. So I, I told myself, no, this is my ticket to freedom. I am getting married because that way I will be free. And I really was. And yes, I, I married because I was in love. Um, if I had not been, I'm sure that I would not have done it. And certainly not that young. I, I see myself and my daughter, who's just 16 now, and I tell myself, but she's just a year younger than when I decided to get married. And they tell me, Mom, you were crazy. You were, you were crazy. How could you? And, and they tell their dad, but how, but dad, how could you do that? You were so young. You were only 19 and mom was only 17. What year was it that you got married? Hmm. I was 17 and now I'm 43. Um, you, know, <laughs> you do the math. <laughs> it was in 80, what? 80, 87, 87 around then. 86 or 87, you know, more or less around that time. I, I was a baby. I was, I was just a baby, but, but with a critical mind that I don't know where I got it from too, too early. But, but I think that um, we're a generation uh, matured with carbide. Um, carbide is that thing that they um, put on bananas to make them ripen faster. And so we were a generation that matured um, just very too quick, too fast, with a lot of responsibilities. Uh, for example, I became responsible for my sister when I was six years old. I took care of I, I took care of my sister when I was six years old. Uh, I took care of my sister who was one. My grandmother took care of both of us, but when my mother um, when she would go, when she would leave for work, um, my father worked out of town and only came home every two weeks. So during those two weeks, I would stay under my grandmother's supervision. 
you know, and my sister under my supervision, a, a six-year-old girl. So I was, I was like her mom when I was six. So then I, I took care of her, and, and um, my mother would tell me before leaving for work, she, she left her work at three in the morning, and would come home around 11 at night from working in the plantations. So she would say, Jami, I'm leaving you uh, two Cordobas. Um, take them and buy the milk, um, buy the firework um, for the beans and the tortillas. You know, so <laughs> this was something normal for me to take on responsibilities. I, I didn't think it was a big responsibility. All I knew was that I had to carry it out, you know, period. You see? I, I was six years old, so at 17, well, <laughs> I think I had done a lot, don't you think? <laughs> so then it was uh, time to, to win some freedom. I wanted to be free. <laughs> and for me, that's what, it, uh, that's what it meant. What kind of work did you focus on after you were married? Well, um, I continued to teach at night, um, and I went to college. I, I finished high school at night and taught during the day. Then I moved to Managua to go to college for five or six years, and I continued working um, in the afternoon. I, um, I studied in the morning, and I worked in the afternoon. Um, and my partner, he did the same. He worked at night in a restaurant um, as a disc jockey. And I would go there and I would wash some dishes and make some extra cash in, in addition to the teaching. And so we saved. And with that, we saved enough to buy the first bed we ever had. And well, for us, it was not difficult. I mean, it's not that I would cry because of the situation we were in. No, it was, it was part of life part of what we had to do and always with that concern of becoming part of something bigger. You know, I was, I was studying psychology when I learned of the existence of the Network of Women Against Violence in 92. So I went when they founded the network um, to see what was going on. Then about two years later, I showed up again when they introduced Violeta Delgado, and she was the new executive coordinator of the network. And I was at that meeting. I, I even remember um, how she was dressed. She had, a light, she had on a light blue pants and a white shirt, and that was Violeta Delgado. I told myself, um, I want to be part of this. I like how these women think. I, I want to be like them. Um, so that's where I began to learn about how to be part of this, this grid that is the network of women. So at this point, I'm talking about I was, uh, I was 20, 21 years old. Um, there's a time where all I did was study and work. Um, but I wanted to be part of something else. So I become involved with the network, and I continue doing other jobs. I continue working, teaching, and I continued going, you know, every once in a while to the network's meetings. After I finished my degree um, in psychology, because it's, it's, that's the career I really liked best. I think it meshed better with what I did and what I had lived. And maybe I also chose it to find myself and, and take care of myself, of my own mental health, because, uh, like I've told you, I, I had had a pretty full life. And so I had to, um, you know, I had to somehow find a, a way out. Um, so I, I acknowledge this because many people say, well, psychologists studied psychology so they can, they can cure themselves. But no, I mean, I also studied it because I wanted to contribute through that career. I wanted to contribute to other women. Yes, I, I, I already wanted to work with women. And so I, um, while I was still working, uh, I mean, while I was still studying, um, for, a, for about two years uh, during my studies, I went to work for La Verde Sonrisa, which was an NGO that worked with children. So there I learned um, to do community work, how to relate to young 
boys and girls who are glue sniffers, um, you know, the, the children who inhale the fumes from the glue, um, who are addicts to that, who have been led to such savagery by, by poverty, really, you know, that it's the way for them to forget who they are or to forget the violence they have suffered. So really, they were living, they were there living violence in real life within their families. I also saw that they had been abused, boys and girls. Um, there was another work that we worked with and had um, pedagogic assistance to help them um, to help them study. Everything I had learned during the revolution um, was turning out to be very useful. Um, this was about when Doña Violeta won the elections. So I also joined the network and also I started doing, um, well, I guess, I guess you would call it political work. This um, this organization um, promoted um, development and education, but it also included ideas um, from the Sandinista Front, and I was also part of that. Uh, so I worked there for two years. Um, after I finished college, I went to work at Dos Generaciones, and this is where I learned to work around issues of um, sexual abuse because Dos Generaciones focuses on prevention of sexual abuse in boys, girls, and adolescents as um, well as the treatment of victims. So I learned more and continued to be part of the network of women. I continued hearing a lot about feminism and continued seeing Violeta Delgado and I, I was starting to meet with Juanita Jimenez and with Marta in, in their sphere of influence. And I would say, wow, these women know so much. They know a lot and they, they produce ideas and, and they, they promote this um, new law, the Act 230. I mean, how are we going to get la laws like this passed? So um, they brought in a bunch of women lawyers at that time. Uh, Juanita was one of them. Um, uh, also, um, Azalia and um, Angela Rosa Acevedo, who is now on the Supreme Court, and um, and she's she's part of the FSLN. She's still part of the FSLN, but she has. Uh, it's horrible to have to use the but. Well, she is also a feminist woman. It's just that she does her work within within the FSLN. Um, not us. None of us do. Um, what I also want to say with this is that at some point in my life, when I was involved um, in the revolutionary process, the youth organization um, was uh, called La Juventud Sandinista. And according to their rules, whoever was doing the type of work that I was doing had to be a member of the Juventud Sandinista. And I, I refused. And I would ask myself, why do I have to sign for something that I feel for, that I live for, that I want to do? And um, they wanted to make me sign up, and they would say, Jamilet, we're going to make you an honorary member. We're going to give you um, political affiliation with the Juventud Sandinista. And I would tell them, no. If you want me to continue contributing the way that I do, doing the work I do, don't force me. I am not going to sign up. I don't want that a piece of paper is what you know obligates me to be here. I want to be here because I want to be here. So, you know, that was a struggle always. And well, things happened the way they did in the 90s, and there was that division, um, which is when uh, Doña Violeta won the elections. And well, there was um, like a disintegration of those agencies that the Sandinista Front had formed. Um, it was like if a bomb fell on them and had destroyed them. So then um, the Juventud Sandinista also fell apart, um, at least in my town. And, well, um, everyone who was still there continued doing you know, their work in the best way they thought possible. I decided to work with women. Others decided to uh, leave the country. 
to become laborers in Costa Rica or in the United States or to go to El Salvador, to Honduras. Lots of people emigrated, many left. Lots and lots and lots of the Juventud Sandinista left the country. Others went to other departments, but very few stayed in the country, at least in my town. Well, uh, just to be mindful of time, I wanted to ask you to tell me a little bit about the work you focused on when you were at the Network of Women Against Violence. Yeah. What kind of mm -hmm. issues did you work on? When I started, I was responsible for a commission that we called Commission on so Psychosocial Development, which began after Hurricane Mitch. A large group of psychologists, so social workers, health workers, and mental health workers, we all got together and we began to organize ourselves in a way that we could contribute our skills to the aftermath of such a large natural disaster and contribute the feminist focus, which each one of us had already embraced um, and that each one of us had already incorporated into our work. So we began to organize processes of emotional healing, but with a different focus, not the traditional clinical focus, but with a feminist focus and uh, a focus on human rights as well. Because if there is a woman who comes to you and tells you, I feel bad because my husband died and, and, and I'm happy. And you ask her, um, why is she happy? And she tells you, well, he used to beat me. And so now I'm happy that he's dead. I'm happy that the mudslide took him with it. <laughs> so then, which is the only explanation that can justify the pain and the guilt and the happiness of that woman? It's the feminist and human rights focus. Because the traditional focus would have blamed her. The traditional focus would have told her that um, she has a disorder. While our focus was telling her, you're right. You're right to feel that way. Your feeling is valid. Um, his time was up, and he died. Uh, it was his turn, and he's dead. So now what? What are we going to do so that from now on, you don't go on carrying the guilt of feeling happy? You see? So you can only get this from a different angle, a different focus, a different look at psychology. It's not the traditional psychology. You see? Um, and we received a lot of help in this work from the Wisconsin delegation. A lot of help with alternative therapies, non-traditional therapies, um, of working through reprocessing traumas, through ocular movements with uh, Reiki. Um, that All that we learned from that delegation. Also massages, acupuncture, that is everything that was non-traditional that we learned from that delegation. And we applied that new knowledge through a different focus. I, I mean, I feel I am a psychologist who can work with a woman who is living with domestic violence, but I work with her with a different focus, a different viewpoint. I see her as a human being in charge of herself, um, as the human being that she is, with rights, with opportunities, just like everyone else. But I do not see her as a mentally deranged being without values um, just because she decided to feel happy about her husband's death. I mean, that liberated her. His death liberated her. It's as simple as that. It's her opportunity to be happy. You know, so from my focus, I don't blame her. And that is the opportunity that feminism gives me, that the network of women with their focus on human rights give me, and that also Dos Generaciones gives me. Dos Generaciones works through the human rights focus. So how do we connect all those strategies? That is the main strategy that we introduced in the network of women. And all those things that we did for people outside the network, we also did for those within the network processes of emotional recovery with women from the network. Some of them decided to become a part of this, some did not. They had, they were, they had the right to choose. And after that, to become, to, uh, to become a member of the executive board professionally. So there we were, Rosa Maria, Juanita, and I, trying to push the national processes. 
Uh, I, I was no longer part of a commission of that large national umbrella organization, but rather part of the umbrella, but also felt like um, a member because of uh, my own responsibility uh, due to the training that I had and my leadership experience. So to train women as leaders, they are the leaders. Someone once asked me, and you're going to teach me to be a leader? To which I replied, no, you're already a leader. You will teach me in the process. Um, what we wanted was for other women who were also leaders um, share their, their knowledge so that the other women, all female leaders, can have the possibility, the opportunity to hear about the different theories that other valuable women have built, to learn about how other women in other countries had written about feminism, to discover other women, you know, from the Re French Revolution. I mean, for so many to learn, they, uh, so many women would say, how is it possible that so women participated in the French Revolution and they didn't even include them in the history books? Uh-huh. Well, what's happening in this history? Women were also erased from the history books of this Sandinista Revolution. So then it was like um, an awakening, unveiling, um, breaking ground, and also identifying, um, you know, I, feminist books, um, for example, to know about uh, Carmen Alborch, who talks about the um, the rivalries among women and how machismo forces us women to become rivals between ourselves and see them as a trophy. Uh, you know how um, sexism or or even the the way in which we are socialized to be women. Uh, domesticates us, that, that we become domesticated like animals, and we are told what things women should and should not do, and what things men will do freely. You know? We, um, we are taught the right way to perform our domestic duties. Um, that's, that's why they're called domestic duties, and women perform them because we have been domesticated to do so. It's, it's like they just turn on a switch when, um, when we're placed before a stove. I, I don't like to cook. I do it because otherwise I go hungry. But I, I learned to dislike it. But, you know, men and women should both learn how to cook. Men and women should know how to clean a house. Men and women should know how to decorate a house and have it look nice. Like this one. You know, but no, because um, that's the woman's work, because it's domestic. It's what domesticates them and forces them to stay inside the house. So uh, we learned all of that in the process of um, feminist foundation, feminist formation in the network, of which I um, fortunately was, was part of that um, in the network. And how many years were you at the network? Nine years. And what year did you leave? Uh, in 2007. How did you, how did you make that to leave? And how did you make that decision to leave? Well, um, within the network, a, as it was growing, as the network was growing, our process um, was made in a way that every three years there would be one coordinating commission and three network executives, right? So. Our term was coming to an end. It was ending in 2007. And there was the possibility of a second term uh, within the network. Um, but um, this transition period coincided um, with the presidential elections. And there was, um, there was a rupture within the women's movement. Uh, some women who were members of the network decided, uh, we decided to also become involved in the autonomous women's movement. And um, we also decided that we wanted to uh, do things in a, in a different way. And another group, another group decided they wanted to do things differently. Really, there were, there were like two groups within the autonomous movement, and this led to a rift where some of us decided to do things one way, to, to do things in a certain way, politics, to do, to do politics in one way, while the others decided to do politics differently. And uh, this all 
coincided with the um, transition period of the Executive Commission. And so the, net, the Women's Network, which was and still is uh, made up of women and is comprised of women's organizations and women's from the feminist movement and women from the autonomous movement. And there are women who participate as individuals. And they all decided that there would be no second term. You know, that's it. They decided there would be a new coordinating commission to steer the, um, that would steer the network and that our term was, was over. You know, we, our term was over and period. And that was a political decision that the network, which, which was made of a group of over 150 women's organizations, and, and they came to that decision. And it was a great learning experience because it, it tells you that, well, uh, what, the as what the assembly wanted and the democracy that we're promoting, well, we, we promote it from within. And this can work uh, for or against an organization. We could have decided that half of the previous members of the coordinating commission could stay so that there would be some sort of continuity. Um, but, but no, um, they, were, they were more radical. They said, no, we are going to have a new coordinating commission. But well, the thing is that they also said that we were very partisan um, because we dared to voice our preference for X or Y party because uh, it was more in line with our ideas. Um, you know, so yet, you know, during a different time in history when the network was, was just getting started and um, many of the women uh, from the network were also members of the uh, Sandinista Front and decided to run for a seat in the assembly, the network supported them. You know, so I dare to say that even within these women's organizations, I, I dare to say, you know, personally, that there are still many ideas from that old um, FSLN. Uh, my friends and colleagues in the women's movement, you know, maybe they don't agree with me, but I do see it that way because, um, you know, there are still many um, authoritarian attitudes um, from that FSLN, you know, just uh, attitudes that tell you uh, this is what we're going to do and this is what we're going to do. But, but we tried. Um, I think that um, our coordinating commission, as well as the one prior to ours, uh, we tried to democratize um, the processes um, within that organization, and, well, they, um, they are still there. So where did you start working after that? Afterwards, I worked as a consultant, um, some voluntary work, um, activism um, with the autonomous women's movement and even with the women's network against violence I consulted for Xochilacal if they asked me for you know to do a w some work for them also with the women in Chinandega the women's movement of Chinandega in Leon in Matagalpa I I, I lent my support to different places in Nicaragua until you started with your current organization yes and well, ap well, um, uh, be well, because time is ending, yes. could well, you after that, what I did was I applied for a job that appeared in the Spanish Agency for International Development Cooperation's website. And I liked it because it sought to support and strengthen that critical route that um, we had talked about for so long in the Women's Network and how to strengthen it so that the institutions would finally, once and for all, start providing um, better services to women. We wanted a concrete project that would support the women's police stations, the public prosecutor's office, the Institute for Legal Medicine, women's organizations, and shelters. You know, uh, shelters are necessary so that uh, fewer women become fatal victims of violence. So that women, although they have lived through violence, know where they can go to place a complaint and that they know that they will be well received at those places and be treated respectfully. You know, we didn't want just words, but for women to be taken in a timely manner, not, you know, two or three months later, to the Institute of Legal Medicine. We wanted this woman not to have to return home, not to become a victim again. So that is basically what this project is trying to do, and I felt that it was a perfect match because um, of all the work that I had done in the network. So um, I am doing the same thing I was doing in, in the Women's Network, but now it's based out of this project called the 
comprehensive services to victims of gender-based violence within the Spanish Agency for International Development and Cooperation. I feel that we are introducing the same feminist focus in all these processes um, with the state institutions. And, you know, let me tell you that they, they have always refused to and still refuse to work with women's organizations, even though women's organizations have been providing services for women victims of violence. Um, we've even provided treatment models uh, for the government. So simply now, Daniel Ortega says, no more work with women's organizations. Now you must work with the ETC. And they broke down all the coordinating network, all the coordinating that the network had built. So with this project, we have been able to rebuild some of that, you know, just a little bit, some of that network of the interinstitutional coordination, as well as with a coordination with the women's organizations. And at least at the local level, at least in Puerto Cabeza, we're getting it done. We're getting it done, you know, a little bit in District 6 and some other districts here in Managua. And proof of this is that the police station, for example, now, uh, well, the police station sends women who are victims of violence, they send them to Acción Ya, to Acción Ya's shelter. But they don't include them in the national budget, you know? So um, the women who are coordinating shelters at this point, they are the ones who have to scramble to keep and support the victims, um, the women victims of violence and all those women whom they have at their shelters, you know? I have two more short questions. You've used this term feminism. Can you tell me what it means to you? How do you define it? Um, a better way of living life. A way of finding um, balance, um, the equality between men and women, between men and men, and between women and women. It does not only mean to find equality between men and women, but to find it between all human beings. For me, it's a philosophy of life that I apply to my life every day, and, and it's hard to undertake sometimes um, because it's also about principles. You know, it's among the most revolutionaries of the philosophies of life. It's super revolutionary because it goes against injustice, not just injustice towards women, but towards men and women. It's in favor of full citizenship. It's in favor of a citizenship without any type of discrimina discrimination. That's what feminism is for me. And are you a feminist? <laughs> Till the day I die. <laughs> yes. And I also want to ask you briefly, how, has the, how have the consequences you've received politically affected your life? Well, of course, because from the beginning, we are harassed by the husbands of the women we defend. We have been harassed by the president because we supported Soil America. We've been harassed by the church because we've supported um, abortion in general, as well as um, therapeutic abortions. And, and how has it affected you personally? Personally? Um, well, I guess personally, it it does affect you whether you like it or not your family becomes involved whether you like it or not your children become involved when they brought charges against us against the nine feminists um, at the end of, of that year that was in 2007 and my son was getting ready to graduate from high school and he comes up to me and tells me mom I was thinking about this I had a dream and I've been thinking about it a lot you know about what I said well you know if at the moment that you um, take me, you know, you take me by the arm to receive uh, my diploma, if the police show up, I am going to call all my friends and we will surround you so that the police can't take you. <laughs> and well, you know, I laughed about it. I, I laugh about it now. I laugh and I share it to my friends, you know, and I also laugh. And well, I, I didn't think... I didn't think that it was something he was really pondering about, but really he was. He was thinking about those things. And a friend of, of me once 
uh, told me, you know that story you shared about your son? Well, um, it really touched one of our um, members. You know, tears were running down her face. And you know, it wasn't until that moment that I really realized how much it affected my son and my daughter. <laughs> my daughter would say, don't worry, mom, they won't come and get you. Or at times they made, um, they made light of it. Um, you know, we would hear the police sirens nearby and they would joke, mom, they're coming for you. And I'd laugh and say, no, 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 they're not coming for me. They're not coming. But, you know, this is something that Nicaraguans do. We make light of serious situations. Of, um, we make light of, uh, of suffering. Um, but really, they were very affected by it. And, and they told me later, they would also say, Mom, don't go to the marches. Mom, they're going to hurt you. Don't go. And I try to calm them down. No, don't worry. Nothing's going to happen. Don't worry, nothing's going to happen. And as they got older and the marches became more, more violent, um, that we were attacked with stones, they would insult us, they would want to beat us with sticks and all of that, well, they started to see the thing as something much more serious. Um, they lived that harassment very close to home. And I lived that harassment too, but I was incredibly angry. I mean, how dare they said they say that we had engaged in unlawful association to commit a crime. We are not criminals. We are defenders of human rights. They would say that we were um, that we were in favor of abortion. Yes, so what? What's the problem with that? They are our bodies, right? Um, they would accuse us of being accomplices to sexual abuses when the biggest accomplice is the president's wife. <laughs> and the criminal is the president, not us. <sighs> so because we were in favor of human rights, um, they were making slanderous and defamatory allegations about us, accusing us of being criminals. We were not criminals. We were not criminals. So I would get so angry, so very angry. And, and also, I, I was not able to um, get a couple of jobs that I applied to. They would say, well, you know, the thing is, while you have this unresolved mod matter, we, we just can't hire you. And the same thing happened to Marta. They told Marta, we can't hire you because um, you have an unresolved matter with the courts. And this affects um, our survival. It affects our children's survival and our right to uh, employment, right? Until, well, the Spanish Agency for Cooperation ventured to hire me, and um, although I still had that uh, unresolved matter. Well, you know, unresolved for them, not me. And um, after that, I just pressed forward. Yeah, Milet, I wish we had more time. I want to thank you for participating in the interview today. Your story is very inspiring. Well, you know, if it helps you at all, I, you know. <laughs> Before the light completely goes, Anjali's going to take a picture of you. So we can take the microphone off.